Welcome to Twisted Tales Unveiled, where we delve into the darkest corners of humanity's crimes. In this gripping video, we explore two chilling stories that sent shockwaves through communities and left a lasting mark on those affected. Join us as we uncover the horrifying chronicles of the Ypsilanti Ripper and Larry Hall, bringing to light the secrets and sinister motives that plagued their paths of terror. John Norman Chapman was born June 17, 1947, in Windsor, Canada. He had two older siblings, a brother and sister. His father abandoned his mother and the children shortly after John was born. His father was reportedly an abusive alcoholic. When John's mother married a second time, it was once again to an abusive alcoholic. When John was two, his stepfather threw him across the family vehicle in a fit of rage aimed at John's mother. On another occasion, his stepfather provoked an argument with another man, who then pulled a gun on him. To defend himself, he used four-year-old John as a human shield. In 1951, John's mother left his abused stepfather and moved with the three children to Detroit, Michigan. She then married William Collins, who adopted all three kids. He was also an alcoholic and frequently became physically abusive. By 1956, John's mother and William had divorced. Despite his turbulent home life, John was an honor student, captain of the football team, and the star pitcher of his high school baseball team. He was by all accounts popular and successful throughout high school. I on 1965, John began studying education at Eastern Michigan University. He was in a fraternity but was kicked out due to suspicion of stealing. He was a successful student and relatively popular on campus. He dated, but the young women he dated often said he was very angry and sexually aggressive. During his sophomore year, his grades started to drop. He was accused of cheating in a class and of petty thefts on campus. Then, in 1966, John learned his sister was pregnant by a man other than her husband. John beat the man until he was unconscious, then beat his sister and called her a tramp. On July 9, 1967, 19-year-old Eastern Michigan student Mary Therese Flesser disappeared after a neighbor saw her walking to her apartment. The neighbor reported seeing a man in a blue-gray Chevy pull up to Mary twice, trying to start a conversation with her. She shook her head both times, so the neighbor surmised the driver was asking her if she needed a ride. She was never seen alive again. On August 7, 1967, two teenage boys found the nude body of Mary Therese Flesser on an abandoned farm. Her remains were identified through dental records, confirming her identity. The autopsy showed Mary had been stabbed approximately 30 times in the chest. Her feet and part of one of her hands were missing. She was beaten severely before her death. Due to the advanced decomposition, pathologists were unable to determine if she was sexually assaulted. The scene showed the body had been moved numerous times after being placed in the field. After the remains were positively identified as Mary Flesser, a young man arrived at the funeral home that was preparing the young woman's body. He said he was a friend of Mary's family and wanted to take a picture of the body as a keepsake to the family. The funeral home informed the man this was not possible, to which he responded, you mean you can't fix her up enough so I could just get one picture of her? He then left the funeral home. The family states they were not aware of who this person was and had not asked him to take a picture of her. He was described as a young white male, handsome, dark hair, and he drove a blue-gray Chevy. Mary Therese Flesser was born December 4, 1947, in Willis, Michigan. She was a graduate of Lincoln High School in 1965 and was attending Eastern Michigan University as an accounting student. She was one of seven children born to Teresa and Chester Flesser. Her father was a mechanical engineer and her mother a homemaker. Mary accomplished a lot during her high school years, earning membership in the National Honor Society, yearbook editor, and participating in the band, orchestra, chorus, and drama clubs. She was a huge fan of the Beatles. She was young, determined, and full of life until the man who became known as the Ypsilanti Ripper stole her life. On June 30, 1968, 20-year-old Joan Shell was traveling to an arbor to visit her boyfriend but missed the bus. She decided to hitchhike. 
Her roommate said a vehicle stopped to pick her up and the driver was a young male, around 20 years old, with clean cut and short dark hair. He matched the description of Joan's neighbor, John Norman Collins. Her body was bound on July 5, 1968. She had been mutilated and placed on a roadside in Ann Arbor, Michigan. The body was identified as Joan Shell. Her autopsy showed she had been raped and stabbed at least 25 times with a knife. The wounds punctured her lungs, liver, and carotid artery. Her throat had also been slit. The lack of blood underneath her body led investigators to believe that her body hadn't been along the roadside long and was placed there after she was killed. While part of her body was preserved, her upper torso and head were badly decomposed, leading investigators to believe her killer tried to preserve her body. The wounds were very similar to those that Mary Flesser had suffered, leading authorities to believe the murders were committed by the same man. Joan Elspeth Schell was born on December 1, 1947, in New Paris, Wisconsin. Her family later moved to Plymouth, Michigan. She was an art student at Eastern Michigan University. Her roommate begged her not to accept a ride that night, and when she failed to check in a few hours later, her roommate reported her missing. Her roommate's instincts were spot on. Police were told that the man seen picking Joan up looked very similar to her neighbor John Norman Collins. He was matched the sketch of the man who asked to take pictures of Mary Flasser at the funeral home. Police questioned him, and he denied knowing Joan. He said he spent the weekend Joan disappeared with his mother in Centerline, Michigan. Police believed the young man and didn't verify his alibi. On March 20, 1969, 23-year-old University of Michigan law student Jane Louise Mixer disappeared. She had posted a note on the college bulletin board asking for a ride across Michigan to her hometown of Muskegon. She had recently become engaged and was traveling to tell her parents of her engagement and planned to move to New York. Her body was discovered in Denton Cemetery in Van Buren Township. Jane's autopsy and murder scene revealed many differences from the murders of Mary and Joan. Jane was found fully clothed, and she had been shot twice in the head. There were no signs of sexual assault in this case. She had a garment tied around her neck and just like the first two victims, was menstruating at the time of her death. For this reason, police connected Jane's murder to that of Mary and Joan, indicating a serial killer was on the loose. This was before the names of Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and John Wayne Gacy made the term serial killer widely known. Jane Louise Mixer was born February 23, 1946, in Muskegon, Michigan. Jane, who was known to be brilliant and passionate, was studying law. She was driven, independent, and a proud feminist. Jane had been her high school valedictorian, giving a fiery speech about social justice. She wanted to change the world, and probably would have. For days after Jane's body was found, police found yet another victim's remains. The nude and severely mutilated body of a teenage girl was found behind a vacant house in a rural area. In fact, the body was found just a few hundred yards from where police found Joan Shell months earlier. The victim was identified as 16-year-old Marilyn Skelton. Marilyn's autopsy and crime scene was so horrific that investigators said it was the worst crime they had ever seen. She had numerous fractures covering one-third of her skull and one side of her face. She had been severely beaten and tortured before her death. Her shirt was stuffed into her throat, likely to muffle her screams. Lacerations on her body led authorities to believe she had been beaten with a leather strap. A tree branch had been violently inserted into her vagina. She too was menstruating at the time of her murder. Marilyn Skelton was a 16-year-old student at Romulus High School. Marilyn was born March 4, 1953, in Wayne County, Michigan. She had last been seen outside a restaurant near Ann Arbor two days before her body was discovered. Marilyn was known as a drug user, dealer, and occasional drug informant. While the similarities between her murder and the others connected all four, police were entirely sure this was not a drug-related crime. Following the discovery of Marilyn's body, authorities formed a coordinated task force from five different jurisdictions. 
Young girls lived in fear of the serial killer terrorizing Michigan. The task force identified that all the victims were brunette Caucasian females who had been menstruating at the time of their deaths. Police found that all victims had similar wounds and had something tied around their necks, linking all four murders together. On April 16, 1969, another body was found. This time, it was identified as 13-year-old Dawn Louise Basom, and she was found on a desolate road in Ypsilanti. She was dressed only in her blouse and bra, which was pushed up around her neck. She had been stabbed numerous times in her chest and genitals. She had slash wounds on her torso, breasts, and buttocks. She was also strangled with electrical cord and a handkerchief was placed in her mouth. There was no conclusive evidence of sexual assault. Don Luis Basom was born on November 28, 1955, in Ypsilanti. She was a middle school student at the time of her death. She had been last seen the night before her body was found, walking home from a friend's house less than a mile from her home. Her sweater and other items of clothing were later located in an abandoned farmhouse near where her body was found. In the farmhouse, police also found fresh human blood stains, indicating the murder had occurred here and her body later dumped. While searching the house, Marilyn Skelton's earring was also found, linking the cases. In May of that year, an arsonist set fire to the house. Five clipped lilacs were laying near the burnt-down house, thought to symbolize the five victims that had lost their lives there. Police were no closer to finding the person responsible for these heinous crimes. Two months later, three teenage boys discovered a sixth body. The body was identified as 21-year-old Alice Callum. Her body was partially nude and beaten severely. Her body was found in a field near a different abandoned farmhouse. She was stabbed several times, two times piercing her heart. She had also been shot in the forehead and then her neck slashed so severely it cut through her spine. Her had been raped and one of her shoes was missing. Alice Elizabeth Callum was born December 25, 1947, in Middlebury, Indiana. Alice was a graduate student at the University of Michigan. She was last seen June 8, 1969, walking home after a party at a friend's house. She was a quiet girl who was interested in photography, often developing her own photos. She was quiet, studious, and very serious about her studies. She had a degree in fine arts and was an excellent student. With the increase in murders across the campuses of Eastern Michigan University and Michigan University, female students were beginning to panic. It was believed that the killer was likely a student. Girls were using a buddy system while walking anywhere, careful to not be alone. Sales of tear gas, knives, and security locks skyrocketed in the area. Hitchhiking, once popular, became rare and dangerous. A reward of $42,000 was offered, which would be about $321,750 today. By July of 1969, over a thousand sex offenders had been questioned and over 800 tips investigated, but no suspect arrested. Police even asked a psychic named Peter Herkos to assist in the investigation. He predicted that the murderer was a strongly built white male under 25 years of age, he was born outside the United States, and he rode a motorcycle. He revealed details of the murders to police that had not been previously released. He also predicted that the killer would strike one more time and soon. On July 23, 1969, 18-year-old Karen Sue Bainman was reported missing by her roommate after she failed to return after curfew. She was a student at Eastern Michigan University. She was last seen around noon on her way to a wig shop downtown. Three days later, her body was discovered nude and face down in a wooded gully. The autopsy revealed she had been beaten extensively and had lacerations so severe that nearly all the skin on her breast had been removed, revealing subcutaneous tissue. She had severe skull fractures and brain injuries. She had also been burned on her breasts and had a piece of cloth in her throat. She ultimately died of strangulation. Karen had been raped before she was murdered and her torn undergarments were found inside her vagina. On those panties, authorities collected human semen and hair clippings. 
Police also noticed that Taryn was a brunette and was menstruating at the time of her murder. Taryn Sue Bainman was born February 10, 1951, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She was a college freshman and told the clerk at the wig shop the day she disappeared that she had two firsts that day, buying a wig and riding on the back of a motorcycle. The clerk described the man as about 22 years old with dark brown hair. Police decided they had to set up a decoy to find this killer. He was known to return to the body after the crime, so police did not immediately release that they had found Karen's body. Instead, they placed a mannequin in place of the body that they bought at J.C. Penney. Around midnight, police noticed a young man running from the site where the decoy was lying. Due to heavy rain, they were unable to capture or identify him. While investigating Karen's murder, police thought the description of the man Karen rode with on the motorcycle matched a description of John Norman Collins. He had been seen riding his motorcycle around Eastern Michigan University on the afternoon of July 23rd. When shown photos of John Norman Collins, the clerk positively identified him as the man with Karen that day. While investigation Collins, they learned that several of his former girlfriends reported he had been angry, sexually aggressive, and became enraged when they were menstruating. He even said he could tell when women were menstruating because he could smell it. His co-workers said he frequently talked about the murders, giving graphic details not released to the public. He later said his uncle, who was a police officer, provided him with these details. His uncle denied sharing any of these details with John. John Norman Collins had been acquainted with most of the victims or had lived nearby. A former girlfriend lived in the same apartment complex as young Don Basom and confirmed that John had met the young girl on multiple occasions. After being identified in a lineup, Collins refused a polygraph test. His roommate said after he became suspect, Collins destroyed a box with shoes, a purse, and other items believed to be missing items from the murder scenes. While John Collins' uncle, the police officer, was on vacation, John stayed at his house. This was during the same time that Karen Bainman disappeared. Upon his return, he notified his colleagues that he found numerous red stains he believed to be blood. Upon investigation, it was determined to be paint. However, while searching the home police found numerous hair clippings that matched those found on Karen's body. The clippings were not John Norman Collins or Karen's but matched his uncle's small children whose hair was cut in the basement shortly before vacation. They also found small blood stains in the basement that matched the blood type of Karen. A neighbor recalled witnessing Collins leaving his uncle's home with a deluxe laundry detergent box and hearing muffled screams the night before. Confronted with the evidence against him, Collins burst into tears but continued to deny he was involved in any of the murders. However, with the hairs matching and other evidence led John Norman Collins to be arrested and charged with Karen Bainman's murder. While awaiting trial, police learned of another possible victim in California. On June 30, 1969, 17-year-old Roxy Ann Phillips was murdered in Salinas, California. Roxy had informed friends she had a friend named John who attended Eastern Michigan University. Upon investigation, it was determined that John and his roommate had traveled to Salinas, California on June 29th. Roxy's nude body was found in a ravine with a dress around her neck. She had been strangled and one earring was missing. John was formally charged with Roxy Phillips' murder in April of 1970. John went to trial for the murder of Karen Bainman on June 2, 1970, in Ann Arbor. Collins chose not to take the stand in his own defense. The primary evidence against him included the clerk's identification of him with Karen, the blood in his uncle's home, and the hairs of his cousins found in her panties. The defense claimed the forensics were unreliable and police were guilty of harassing Collins. On August 19, 1970, John Norman Collins was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. During the trial, police realized that most of the victims resembled Collins' mother. They also noted that the murder stopped after his arrest. His mother and sister defended him, insisting he was innocent and railroaded. Collins has appealed his conviction several times, all unsuccessfully. Police found more evidence that Collins was guilty of killing the other victims, although he was never charged. 
For example, Collins and Flasser were working in the same building at the time she died. Another witness said he saw Shell with Collins the night of her disappearance. Another witness claimed Collins had an argument with Alice Callum shortly before she was killed. A boot print on her body matched Collins' boots. Around the time of Roxy Phillips' murder, John was treated in California for anaphylaxis caused by poison oak, and Roxy's body was found in a patch of poison oak. In 1980, John changed his last name to Chapman, the last name of his biological father. As he is a dual citizen of the United States and Canada, he requested transfer to a prison in Canada. This request was originally granted but reversed in the wake of public outrage when the public learned that Canada would likely parole him. He has been in trouble in prison for contraband violations. He refuses to give interviews for the most part but continues to insist he is innocent. In July of 2005, DNA evidence from the murder of Jane Mixer identified that John Norman Collins was likely not her killer. 62-year-old Gary Lederman, a former nurse, was identified as the killer and charged with her murder. Jane's murder was significant different from the others as she was found clothed and shot. Lederman was convicted and sentenced to life without parole. He is not considered a suspect in any of the other murders. Since the advancements in DNA technology, more evidence from the other murders has come to light. DNA on Alice Callum's clothing was a positive match for John Norman Collins. John Norman Collins continues to deny his involvement in the crimes but has exhausted all his appeals. He rarely gives interviews or answers questions but requested that everyone leave his mother out of it. It's now been more than 50 years since the reign of terror stopped in Ypsilanti and in Arbor, and John Collins remains in prison in Michigan to this day. On a fall day in 1993, a teenage girl in Georgetown, Illinois, was out riding her bike. As her sister left home, she drove past her sister on the long country road. Moments later, the girl was gone. The investigation into her disappearance would uncover unthinkable evil, leading to more questions than answers. This is the story of the Wooden Falcons, the victims of Larry Hall. Jessica Lynn Roach, known as Jessie, was born November 27, 1977, to Charles and Terry Lynn Roach. Her family included two sisters and a brother. The Roach family were active members of the Church of Jehovah Witnesses. Jessica loved the movie Gone with the Wind, reading, and dreamed of becoming a pilot. She was a good kid who stayed out of trouble. On the afternoon of September 20, 1993, Jessica disappeared. Her father and sister had seen her riding her bike. A half hour later, her abandoned bike was found in an area of disturbed gravel, igniting horrible fears that she was the victim of foul play. The search for Jessica lasted two months before her remains were found by a farmer in a cornfield across the border in Indiana. Extensive decay and damage from the farmer's equipment caused Jessica's body to be damaged too severely to determine cause of death. Fingerprints were used to positively identify Jessica, comparing those prints to ones she had taken at school as part of a child safety presentation with police officers. The detectives had very little to no evidence in the investigation. Jessie's grieving family mourned the loss of their daughter and hoped answers would come. Almost a year later, in October of 1994, who girls in the Georgetown area reported a suspicious person in a van following them around. The girls wrote down the license plate number of the van and retreated home. When they informed police of the disturbing incident, the license plate was tracked to an Indiana man named Larry Hall. Upon questioning the man, they learned he had been in the Georgetown area for a war reenactment, a hobby he shared with his twin brother Gary. He had also been in the area at the time Jessica Roach had disappeared. Larry Hall was brought into the Wabash, Indiana Police Department for questioning. Detectives claimed when they showed him a photo of Jessica Roach, Larry flinched. However, he denied ever seeing her. Larry was questioned for two and a half hours, continuing to insist he knew nothing about Jessica Roach's disappearance. He was then released. Two weeks later, he was brought in once again for questioning. This time, Larry Hall gave a confession. According to his defense team, this was a coerced confession, 
but this was enough to place Hall under arrest and charge him with the murder of Jessica Roach. The confession was taken after more than 12 hours of interrogation, an interrogation that was not recorded in any fashion. The defense team filed a motion to suppress the confession, alluding to unprofessional conduct by the detectives, but the motion was denied. Because Jessica was taken across state lines, Larry Hall was charged federally with kidnapping for purposes of sexual gratification resulting in death. He was quickly convicted and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Larry Hall was no stranger to law enforcement on the Indiana side of the border. He had been arrested multiple times for stalking. Larry Hall was born December 11, 1962, in Wabash, Indiana. He grew up with his identical twin brother, Gary. Gary was outgoing, friendly, and had lots of friends. Larry, however, was reclusive and socially awkward. Gary grew up and moved away, but Larry remained in Indiana caring for his aging parents and cleaning offices at night. Perhaps the differences in the twins resulted from a loss of oxygen Larry experienced at birth. His mother also stated that Gary fed off Larry in the womb, which is known as a monochorionic pregnancy, Wikipedia. Larry grew up assisting his father in his work as a grave digger. He had committed several petty crimes in his youth. When Jessica's body was found, another family found themselves praying the body belonged to their missing daughter Trisha Reitler. Trisha Lynn Reitler was born February 9, 1974, to Gary and Donna Reitler of Ohio. Trisha was a college student at Indiana Wesleyan University in Marion, Indiana. Her parents had encouraged her, their eldest child, to attend the university because the school operated on the same religious morals and values as the Reitler family. Her father remembers dropping her off at school in the spring of 1993. Trisha begged him not to go. A few days later she disappeared. Trisha was working in a term paper in her dorm room when she grew restless. She decided to take a break and watch to the nearby grocery store. She purchased a soda and magazine and left the store. She never made it back to her dorm room. Trisha's blood-soaked jeans were found on the path back to her dorm room, but her remains have never been found. She is presumed dead, but her family hold out hope that they can bring her remains home one day. The day after Larry Hall confessed to the murder of Jessica Roach, he claimed he was only telling authorities about his dream and recanted the entire confession. In his van, police found items indicative of Larry's guilt. These included a map that had markings where Jessica was abducted and where her body was found and newspaper clippings of both Reitler and Roach's disappearances. There were handwritten notes describing his actions in the spring of 1993, when Trisha Reitler disappeared. Larry described stalking women outside the grocery store Trisha was last seen at. Also, a to-do list was found including things such as cut out stained carpet, burn paint tarps, buy new hacksaw blades, clean all tools, on the case with Paul is on. Police now believe Larry Hall was responsible for Trisha's death. In fact, he admitted to the murder but again recanted. With lack of evidence, no charges were filed against Larry Hall in connection with Trisha Reitler's disappearance. Detectives and the family of Trisha Reitler sought answers and closure. While in federal prison, detectives wanted to get justice for Trisha. They found a convicted drug dealer with no history of violence who had recently been sentenced to federal prison. They offered him the deal of a lifetime, obtain useful information that implicates Larry Hall as Trisha's murderer and uncover the location of her remains and the convict could walk free with a clean record. Jimmy Keene accepted the offer and was sent to the same prison as Larry Hall. Jimmy Keene went undercover as a special informant. The charismatic young man was able to befriend Larry Hall relatively easily by indicating Larry was a cool guy and giving him plenty of positive attention. Jimmy stood up for Larry during a jailhouse altercation, beating another prisoner and finding himself in solitary confinement. He had earned Larry's respect and trust. They spent much time together once Keen left solitary confinement. Larry told his new friend how he strangled Jessica Roach. A few weeks later, he admitted to killing Trisha Ryder by choking her. He claimed to have blacked out, not remembering the actual murder. He buried her with lime in the woods, a 
according to what he said to Keane. Keane said he felt physically sick around Larry Hall and found it difficult to maintain their friendship. A few days after the confession, Jimmy walked in on Larry carving wooden falcons and placing them on a map of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. Hall told Keane that the wooden falcons were there to watch over the dead. Keane believed the map would lead to Trisha's body. After informing the FBI of the map, Jimmy broke his cover telling Larry Hall was a piece of garbage he was in landing Keen back in solitary confinement. By the time the FBI got the message, the map was nowhere to be found. Jimmy Keen, after spending months befriending a psychopath, was set free despite the mission being essentially a failure. The relationship between Keen and Hall is the topic of Apple TV's Blackbird. Trisha's body has never been found. Larry Hall is suspected of many other murders as well, some of which he has confessed to only to recent later. Some of these include the Dean Marie Pyle Peters, a 15-year-old girl who disappeared from her middle school in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1981. Dean was at her resting practice when she asked to use the restroom, leaving the gym. Her mother, attending her practice, waiting for her daughter to return. She never did. The school custodian was suspected, but no evidence ever connected him credibly. Another suspect was the male friend of two girls who were angry at Dean over a boy. It is rumored that he drove his truck towards her to scare her but slid on ice and ran her over. Rumors claim he buried her somewhere, but her body was never found. Some people believe she was the first victim of Larry Hall. Twelve-year-old Deborah Jean Cole disappeared from her hometown of Lebanon, Indiana in 1981. She was initially classified as a runaway, but that was changed in 1983 when Deborah's sister Frances went missing and was found murdered. In 1999, DNA evidence linked the boyfriend of Deborah and Frances's mother to Frances's murder. The suspect had already died years earlier and was never prosecuted. Although it seems likely he also killed Deborah, Larry Hall has been investigated in the case as well. Jennifer Lee Schmidt disappeared in 1985 from the campus of Purdue University in Indiana. The 19-year-old's body has never been found although she is presumed dead. Marcy Fuller Swinford was a 21-year-old mother of four in 1985 when she went out to run errands. Her body was found near Honey Creek Bridge in Indiana. Denise Diane Flum was an 18-year-old senior at Connorsville High School in Indiana in 1986. She disappeared while going to the site of a party she had attended the night before to locate her purse. In 2020, her ex-boyfriend, in prison for unrelated crimes, confessed to killing her but refused to lead authorities to the body. He was terminally ill and died before being tried for the crime. On his deathbed, he told his lawyer he did not commit the crime and was only trying to get out of jail. Larry Hall is considered a suspect in each of these cases. Folia Mila Chavez, the Summerfield Jane Doe, was found in a cornfield in 1986 mutilated and murdered. Years later she was finally identified as Folia, a drifter from California. Somehow, the drifter was murdered and disposed of in the tiny town of Summerfield, Illinois. Another murderer, Dale Anderson, is also a suspect in this case. Kimberly and Thompson disappeared in 1986 from Champaign, Illinois. Her body has never been found. Linda Weldy disappeared from her bus stop in La Porte, Indiana in 1987. Her body was found murdered three weeks later. The case remains cold. Diana Jane Braunert, an 18-year-old from Crystal City, Missouri, left her job at Venture one night in 1987. She was never seen again. Wendy Louise Felton disappeared in 1987 from Marion, Indiana. She has never been found. Paula Webster was a 19-year-old who disappeared from Chester, Illinois, in 1988. Larry Hall confessed to her abduction and murder, but later recanted. Cynthia Louise Carmack disappeared in 1988 from an Ohio shopping mall. The 15-year-old has never been found. Penny Dawn Lease, a 23-year-old woman, disappeared in 1989 near the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign after working at the Omni Fitness Center. Laura DePise was 20 years old when she disappeared in 1992 from Wisconsin. Larry Hall confessed to kidnapping and murdering her, 
although charges were never filed. In all these cases, Larry Hall may be a suspect. What struck me about researching each of these missing women, I found striking similarities in their appearances. All the women were under 25 and most had long brown hair. Is Larry Hall a serial confessor or a serial killer? Some believe he confesses to crimes for attention, while others believe he may be one of the most prolific serial killers in the Midwest, with nearly 50 murders tied to him. His twin brother told Paulazon that he still loves his brother but is repulsed by his brother's actions on the case with Paulazon. Larry Hall remains incarcerated in the federal prison system to this day. As we conclude this bone-chilling journey into the lives of the Ypsilanti Ripper and Larry Hall, we are left with a mix of emotions, horror, fascination, and a renewed awareness of the human capacity for darkness. These stories serve as a haunting reminder that evil can lurk in the most unexpected places, and the resilience of survivors can triumph against the odds. Remember, behind every twisted tale, there are countless untold stories of strength, hope, and the relentless pursuit of justice. Let us carry these narratives as a reminder to remain vigilant and support those affected by such harrowing experiences. Thank you for joining us on this unnerving expedition through the Ypsilanti Ripper and Larry Hall's terrifying worlds.